All right, and welcome to our class, Professor Leon Sturfeld from the Department of History at Penn State University. Welcome, thanks so much for coming in today. Thank you for having me. Okay, so you are an expert in uh, modern day Iran and we were hoping to have a conversation with you about some of the key uh, misconceptions about Iran and how it relates to Iran's international relations and public diplomacy. So let's begin with the misconceptions. Uh, mo for most Westerners, especially in the United States, when they think about Iran, they think about the 1979 revolution and the modern day regime of Iran. Can you speak a little bit about some of the misconceptions regarding modern day Iran? So if we were talking about uh, post-revolutionary Iran, uh, I think that the, the perception that is most widely held is that Iran is a is a dictatorship uh, lacks any uh, characteristics of uh, civil society or democracy or uh, representation. And while Iran is a very, um, I would say that the regime is very broken and the system is uh, is definitely not what I would call a healthy democracy. Iran is more of a democracy than what we tend to think and more than more of democracy than uh, than its neighbors. Um, and this is something that uh, is so important to understand when we talk about Iran today. Um, there are elections. Uh, there is a constitution that is very uh, revered and very uh, highly regarded. Um, there are term limits for presidents. Um, but but not for, for not for ayatollahs. I, no, I wait. Ayatollah, you mean uh, you mean the supreme leader? Mm -hmm. Ayatollah is, is a religious rank. It's yeah. not it's not a position. Mm -hmm. And you're right. There is no term limit for the supreme leader, but there is. Uh, for all the ayatollahs in the in the committees that constitute the government, so it's it's an elected position, um, and um, minorities have representation in the parliament. Religious minorities have reserved seats in the parliament. So again. I wouldn't call it democracy, and I wouldn't model any other country after the Iranian model, but I, it's important to know that there is a vibrant civil discourse in Iran, and there is a vibrant civil society in Iran, and there is room for expression of discontent. There is an oppression, for sure, and the prisons are full of political prisoners and full of uh, people, innocent people, who had done nothing wrong but belonging to some movements that are considered illegal or Baha'is, for example, that are being persecuted on religious basis. And this is the only religious minority that is not recognized as a religious minority. Having said that, we cannot dismiss the role of the free press in Iran and uh, well, not the free press, the, the role of the press in Iran and, and uh, NGOs that have been uh, active in Iran on and off for the past 40 years since the revolution. Okay, well, let's delve into the uh, complexity of Iran. For Again, for a lot of people in the West, they think of it as a homogeneous nation, right? It's a Shiite majority. Can you speak about some of the tapestry of Iran's population? So Iran is actually one of the most diverse countries in the world. Um, while religiously 95% is, uh, is Muslim and uh, of this 95% about 90% are Shia, um, Iran is a country for 27 religious and ethnic minorities. Um, and some of them are actually quite large minorities. Uh, in fact, the Persian the ethnic group of the Persians, uh, which we, you know, again, usually believe that Iran is majority Persian, uh, they constitute about between 49 to 51 percent uh, of, the, of the Iranian society. Um, 
the rest, a very large minority is the Azeris. Um, there are Baluchis, Luris, uh, Arabs, um, and, uh, and Iran is also home for um, religious minorities. So we talk about uh, there is a community, there's a Jewish community in Iran, the second biggest Jewish community in the Middle East outside Israel. Um, there is a fairly big uh, Christian uh, minority. Uh, there is an Armenian uh, minority, an Assyrian minority. There is a Zoroastrian minority, uh, and the Zoroastrian en enjoy special status in Iran uh, for being, well, more or less the, the original uh, Iranians. Um, again, there is one religious minority that is not recognized as such, and this is the Baha'is. And their story is, is the story of uh, human rights, and, and it's a tragedy on every level. Well, let's, let's, uh, let's throw in the conversation about identity in the context of how the regime engages its own people and tells its own story and how Iran engages people, uh, other nations, right? So folks outside of its own nation. Let's begin with the domestic story, right? Uh, Pre-1979 revolution, there was a strong wave of nationalism. Can you talk about nationalism in Iran and in the Middle East and its role in uh, the domestic narrative regarding who a person is in the context of their nation? So I would say that the story of Iranian nationalism is not something that started, uh, it's not limited to uh, any uh, range of uh, limited years. Um, the challenge of the Iranian government from the 1920s, uh, actually it started before, but I mean, in 1925, Mohammad Reza, uh, not Mohammad, Reza Pahlavi becomes the new Shah of Iran. He establishes the last dynasty, the Pahlavi dynasty. And, um, and the biggest challenge for him was uh, to create a unified identity. And what is it unless, I mean, if you don't, make it turn it into a religious, a national identity. And uh, knowing very well that, and he, Reza himself came from a subgroup of ethnic minority. Um, so he knew that the, the, the only way to create, or not the only way, but he looked, he looked at Ataturk in Turkey. And he thought that the model that, uh, that Ataturk used in Turkey can be used or can be borrowed and, and implemented in Iran. And this was, you know, trying to, uh, to create this form of, of cohesive nationalism, uh, something that can be implied and applied equally across the country. Um, so he, he started uh, several uh, reforms that meant to unify the country around the Persian national identity. Uh, the way to do it was to, first of all, uh, forbid Iranian minorities from using their own languages and to make the Persian language the national and only legitimate language. So minorities that have been speaking other languages and have been teaching other languages and have been uh, publishing their newspapers in different languages were forced to, uh, to basically move all their communications into Persian. Um, another thing that happened was, so schools and missionary schools, and remember, now this is a good time to remember that at the time, one of the most uh, prevalent phenomena in the Middle East was the missionary and, and the foreign schools. So this is the beginning of the American University in Cairo and Beirut, and this is the Alliance schools and missionary French schools and Catholic schools. And they all taught in their respective languages, right? French, English, uh, Italian, whatever. Uh, so all of these schools had to, uh, to, go to, uh, to move to Persian. And another aspect of it was to diminish the role of Islam and elevate the status of, of the national identity. So it's reconnecting to the 
cultural roots of Iran, to Cyrus the Great, to, uh, and this was actually a way for, for example, for the Jews to become a more prominent part of the Iranian nation because they speak only Persian. They didn't have to, uh, to adapt to new reality. And also they connect very well to the, uh, to the myth of Cyrus the Great. Cyrus being perceived as the liberator of Jews in Iran. So um, this was, this was the, the beginning of the modern project of Iranian nationalism. Now, I can talk about it for an entire semester, so I won't... But, but I won't. Let's, let's not do that. But, but let's talk about the Farsi identity. Uh, despite the, the uh, Iranian revolution of 79, how much of the Farsi revolution is still in place for modern day Iranians. I'm sure the the Ayatollahs were not able to completely erase it. They were not. They were not happy with it, and they tried to uh, to you know to make it disappear. Long story short, they failed. Uh, the Iranian culture, the Persian culture, is very much the dominant culture in Iran today. Uh, the Nuruz, the Iranian, uh, the Persian New Year is the most important holiday in Iran. Uh, I mean, this is something, uh, the, the, all, all the festivities of, of, of the Nuruz are the, the center of Iranian cultural and social life. Um, poetry and literature from the pre-Islamic period are, perceived to be the, the top of the Iranian culture still today. Um, you know, again, there are, there are tensions between the Islamic and the, and the Iranian um, pillars of, of, the, of the Iranian culture, but um, usually the upper hand is, is for the Iranian culture. Okay. Well, let's talk about the Farsi uh, narrative and how uh, Iran can and potentially can engage other people in other nations in its public diplomacy, right, through for, uh, evoking the Farsi identity. Which nations around Iran still has um, Farsi uh, identity as a part of its own? And in what ways do you think Iran have or can use that to engage those folks? So what we're talking about is the um, is the, the Persianate world, which is the concept, it's an analytical concept and it signified uh, all the countries and territories that were at one point or another part of the Persian empire. Uh, the countries that we know today uh, that belong to this Persianate world are Afghanistan, uh, some include India in it, uh, at least part of India, and there are very interesting relations between Iran and India uh, throughout history. Uh, Tajikistan, uh, Georgia, um, Uzbekistan, all the, all the Caucasus are very much uh, part of the Persian world. And, and, and Azerbaijan, which is a, a fantastic, uh, you know, example for a uh, complicated relationship with the, with the mothership. Mm -hmm. Well, let, let's talk about that. So Azerbaijan is a really interesting case study in its uh, relationship with both Iran and the West. Can you speak about that? So Azerbaijan was a uh, part of, of Iran. Um, in fact, uh, part of Azerbaijan is still uh, an Iranian territory, and this is the home for about 20% of the Iranian population uh, that is Azeri and Turkish speaking. Um, Azerbaijan, the independent Azerbaijan that we know today, the former uh, Soviet Republic, um, is a predominantly Shi, um, Azeri, Turkish speaking, um, and it became, it had few stages of quasi-independence and, uh, and I would say influence of Iran and Russia uh, in the early 20th century. And then in the 1920s, it had become a Soviet Republic. Uh, 
even when it was a Soviet Republic, it still maintained very close connection to Iran. And it, in fact, it, it became the shelter of Iranian political dissidents that fled to Azerbaijan. So they can still be technically in Iran, but, but free from a persecution of the Iranian government. Um, and post-independence, post-1991, when Azerbaijan became a free country, independent country again, uh, it is a dictatorship. Uh, it is very rich in natural uh, resources. Um, and um, it had taken a decision to align, align itself with, uh, with Western powers that could invest uh, capital in the country and develop the, the local industry. Um, and formed very close relationship with again with the US with the with NATO and other and and other western countries but also um very close relationship with Israel the arch enemy of Iran uh since 1979 um and we you have to remember and I don't know if your students can see the the map that Azerbaijan is the, a neighbor, like they share a border with Iran. It, it is strategically located for, you know, with all the tension between Iran and Russia, Iran and the West, Iran and Israel, Azerbaijan became this uh, holy grail of, uh, of geopolitics in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, they used, and they used a kind of uh, intimate relationship or informal relationship with, uh, with Iran to also uh, to ease tensions between them and Iran, but also to increase the involvement of other countries in their internal affairs. And, and what a great case study to showcase the complexity between identity, multiple identities and geopolitics in the Middle East, where the people of Azerbaijan, as you said, they, many of them speak Turkish, right? And they belong to that Turkish block of language, right? Language identity and also belong to the Farsi bloc, right? And they they really balance, I mean, you know, the, the Turks are primarily Sunni, the Iranians are primarily Shiite, so we, we see- But the Azeris are Shiite. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, right? So yeah. they, they have multiple, they belong to one ethnic group, one language, oh, two language groups in a way. Yeah. Uh, they belong to different, so again, geopolitics in the, in the Middle East and identity, it's never as clear cut. However, in Western eyes, that's not the case, right? I mean, most folks who are first comers to the Middle East sort of see, um, you know, the, the countries in terms of them and us, black and white, right? And the, the, can you speak about the complexity of identity in the Middle East as a whole? Well, this is, uh, it's v very difficult to talk about it uh, in, in, in a short manner. Um, I would say that, you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll give you uh, an anecdote that I think represents large portions of the Middle East. Uh, and the anecdote is actually taken from, uh, from India, although we have a similar one from Lebanon. Mm -hmm. uh, in the 1860s, uh, Britain, uh, was looking to deepen its control over India uh, and they conducted a survey. Uh, I would say almost nationwide uh, survey and people had to check two boxes. Are you Hindu or Muslim? And 90% checked Hindu and 90% checked Muslim. <laughs> and uh, this fluidity it doesn't show i mean it had become some kind of a joke right like what are they do they don't know did they try to play the british no it's actually this is a very good uh expression of how fluid uh identities are in the non-western i mean identity dichotomy is a western phenomenon uh, we ask to clarify what are you, but people were Muslims when in some time, in some context, 
they were Muslim when they were negotiating with Muslim uh, merchants or when they uh, were dealing with uh, endowment, with the Muslim endowment money, uh, when they were, I mean, they were Muslims in certain contexts and they were Hindus when they were in different contexts and intermarried uh, families were both like they were really equally both uh the same same story uh we have similar i mean the the numbers are less uh staggering than this one but in lebanon there was the same you know lebanon in the pre-colonial period was a country of was a province of the ottoman empire it was relatively independent um and the, there were um we tend to talk about 25% Sunni, uh, 15 to 20% Shi, 15% uh, uh, Druze, and, and majority Christian. So the, the plurality of Christian. And in several times when the French government, the French mandate later on, uh, they tried to, to, so the entire perception was to create a Christian enclave in the Middle East, but they couldn't separate them from the others. So they started to Im implement policies that would separate them and create the, the exclusive identity. But this is not something that organic to the region. It wasn't organic to Lebanon. It wasn't organic to India. And, and not surprisingly, all the separation, all the, the partition solutions that we see in the non-Western world in the 20th century were eventually created by the colonial powers and not by, and not by again, organic uh, development of the countries. But nevertheless, this is a great point, right? So hundred years ago, one would not say I'm a Lebanese or I'm an Iraqi or I'm an Iranian, but rather I am, you know, a Jew from Baghdad. Or I'm, uh, you know, this uh, Coptic from, uh, you know, uh, let's say Alexandria, but nowadays, Right in 2020, we are seeing all over the world, right, in Europe, in the United States, and all around the Middle East, a very strong return to both to tribalism, right, and you can call that tribalism any way you want, but in the context of Iran, and in modern day Iranian geopolitics, there is a very strong focus on the Shia. Sunni conflict, and uh, there many have been arguing that the last 15 to 20 years of conflict in the Middle East, outside of Israel, really focuses on this cold war between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Can you speak about it? Yeah, um, I would frame it differently. I, Please do. I would not call it uh, Sunni-Shia rivalry. Um, it's... It, it's a competition over resources and influence. Mm -hmm. It's not about religion. It's not, I mean, if, if there's anything that the Islamic revolutions tried to do uh, in its early days is to dismantle the, the Sunni-Shia uh, rivalry element, right? Because uh, Khomeini declared uh, Shia as the fifth madhab of the fifth, uh, religious school of the Sunni world. Um, the, there was no attempt to um, to um, to sectarianize political tensions. This is a political rivalry between Iran and Saudi Arabia, and uh, again, you can see. Um, Sure, it it has some elements. I mean, in the in the in the proxy wars, there are range of identities that you would expect to align of of groups that you would expect to align with Iran and those that you would expect to align with uh, Saudi Arabia. But eventually, we have to look at the countries. Um, their economy is based on oil. They have limited resources, I mean, limited in terms of defined, not limited in, in quantity. Um, and they have to find a way to 
practice their influence. Mm -hmm. um, but but the narrative, but the but the narrative is really when you look at Yemen, when you look at Iraq. I mean, all around the Muslim world, it's it's the Shias versus the Sunnis. It's the same as saying that the Cold War no, was I mean, not about Iraq, capitalism example. versus communism. Yeah, no, uh, it's definitely not capitalism uh, versus communism. But look at I Iraq is actually a very good example mm -hmm. because Iran in 2003 and a few years after the uh the invasion um iran thought that it, it would make it easier on them to connect with uh shi groups in the country and exercise influence right but then look what happened in the past five years uh the communist party of iraq is made of a coalition between the communist, the traditional communist party, and the uh, and the followers of Muqtada Sadr, which is who is an, a, a Shia mullah, um, and uh, and they formed the strongest opposition to Iranian presence in in Iraq. Uh, the Sunni-led coalition is actually much more comfortable with Iran today, uh, because they try to play it against Saudi Arabia and against Iran and, and against the U.S. So. I mean, when you look at the details, you find that uh, Shia Sunnah conflict is is plays a role, but very minimal compared to the uh, to the image of Cold War between uh, Shia and, and uh, Sunnah. Um, and, and and also highlighting the complexity of uh, Middle Eastern geopolitics, right? Right. And and one of my favorite examples is look, Iran and Iraq had a war for eight years costly, deadly war. Uh, it ended in 1988. In 1990, Iran, Iraq um, found itself in conflict with the US that, by the way, supported it during the Iran-Iraq war. And Iran, without, I mean, with swallowing large amount of, of its pride, stood by Iraq despite you know, despite everything that happened, despite everything that uh, that uh, happened with with the war, despite them being led by a Sunni dictator, uh, they stood by Iraq because this was about uh, geopolitics. Yeah. Fascinating stuff and fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for joining us today. I really think you shed a lot of light on everything that is going on in Iran and all the challenges and opportunities for the Iranians in the Republic diplomacy. If people want to get in touch with you, is there a Twitter account to follow? There is Twitter. It's my name, uh, at Lior Sternfeld. Um, and my email is lbs18 uh, at psu.edu. Okay, awesome. And they can also Google you. So that's always an easy way to uh, get more info. Thanks again. We really appreciate it. My pleasure.